Welcome to the Southbridge Music Mixer. Um, I would like to introduce Zach Balch and Kalina Michaela. They're going to talk to us about making an album, right? Yes. Anything else I should add to that? No, they're going to add it. I don't need to add it. They'll add it. So please give a warm welcome to Zach and Kalina. Well, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Trish and Wes, for having us. And Renee. Thank you for that. For the trip Thanks out in yeah. <laughs> Renee's a friend of ours from the Dallas scene. And uh, we borrowed some, he helped us out with a gig the other day in Denver, and we ended up borrowing some of his gear and going to return that to you today. Uh, plus, all your beers are on us for today. Uh, <laughs> drink responsibly, but you know, enjoy yourself. Um, yeah, so thank you guys so much for having us. Well, we are Karina and Zach, and I'm guessing everyone in this room knows that by now. But uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about our new blog, Flint Creek Family. It's basically about our pursuit of artful living as we navigate through our artistic endeavors. As singer songwriters, musicians, and owners of Flint Creek Records, we've come to learn that not all music careers involve fame and fortune, nor should they. Many artists like us have several jobs uh, to make it work. And our goal is to find our ideal work-life art balance and craft a lifestyle that best meets our unique needs and empower other artists of any medium to do the same. So I, I personally have identified as a uh, singer, songwriter, uh, producer, engineer, guitarist, sound guy, worship leader, music supervisor, booking agent, and even did a stint working for the Grammys uh, for a little bit. But I've never really considered myself an artist until quite recently. Uh, and it is liberating as hell to be able to define yourself with such a simple, useful term. That's a lot. Did you miss any? Maybe. <laughs> but artist is such a nice way to sum up all that we do. For myself, I have been singing as long as I can remember, and I've been writing songs and performing them for about a decade now. But it wasn't until recently that I've really started to feel like an actual artist. What I'm realizing now is that any one person doesn't have to, or any one person's art doesn't have to fit into one small box. Now that I've started to pursue writing prose with a blog and even incorporating visual elements into my musical projects, I feel as though all of those endeavors fit together into, to make my total artistry. So we wanted to ask your definition of what an artist is. Just right off the top of your head, your gut. What is an artist? Person that makes something tangible that's creative. Per okay, awesome. A person that makes something tangible that's creative. Or an experience. Yeah. Or experience. Oh, experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I like that. Yep. What would you have to say about that? Uh, I think it's, it's a quote wrongly attributed to Thomas Aquinas, I think. But uh, it's like he who makes something with his hands is a craftsman, something with his hands in his head. Well, his, his hands is a laborer. Hands in his head as a craftsman, his hands head is hard as an artist. So that's really cool. That's a nice so I, I can't. So we don't have to look that up because yeah. I don't want to see it in writing, but yeah. that's, that's, that's really nice. It's hard to debunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Thanks for your participation. Um, Zach, you have a question? Yeah. Um, what is your definition of artist? Well, I think it's a good question. The question that I've been really trying to explore is what's the difference between artist with a capital A than from singer songwriter or guitarist, you know, what what connects those two things? At what point in your creative journey do you earn the title of being an artist? Uh, I think that anyone can identify themselves as an artist, but it's really others um, others will identify you, identify you as an artist based on the quality of your work. As and, well as the lifestyle that you lead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, the definition that we've kind of come up with just for the purpose of this conversation is an artist is an individual that pursues creative expression in any or many mediums throughout the course of their entire life. Uh, we say that it is not an accomplishment, but a lifestyle. Uh, and we're sure that you already know this, but it's important that we establish that artists can do many things because in this discussion we're going to refer to artists uh, as the client or songwriter uh, and then the producer, uh, which we refer to as, the, the, it, which is the facilitator for the record making process. Uh, this person very much is, is an artist as well um, and should also hold themselves to artistic standards. Yes, so today's session again is 
creating an album, but rather on focusing on technical, creative, or logistical know-how. We really wanted to speak to the interpersonal commitment to the record, uh, of the record making process. So, the central thing that we landed on is managing expectations. We think that everything really revolves around this idea. And lately, Zach has been kind of developing his own proverb, so to speak, that I think is really poignant, uh, you know, both in this process, but also in life in general. Yeah, proverb makes it sound uh, a lot more thought out than it really is. But, but essentially, I think that uh, most conflict arises from either unexpressed or unrealistic expectations. Yes, so we'll leave you with that simmer for a moment. But uh, I think that before you even get into the studio, before you hit record, there are some really important conversations that you should have starting with yourself as an artist. And I think that this is a very easy step to skip but it's very important to really set yourself up to being successful rather than disappointed. So, managing your own expectations. What do I want to accomplish with this project? I, we came up with a list of healthy expectations and some dangerous expectations. So, uh, some healthy expectations are, one, to create a work of art, quite simply. Uh, to have fun in the process, to be surprised by new musical ideas, to learn about the recording process itself. Um, as an artist, you'll probably pick up a lot of new skills and knowledge every time you create an album. Uh, to learn about yourself and your own artistry, to learn how to com better communicate your ideas, and to build li lifelong creative relationships with other artists and your collaborators. And some things that we've kind of described as dangerous expectations are not necessarily wrong or bad, but they can really set you up for some conflict with your producer because you're raising the bar a little bit higher than maybe what you need to, to set it up. And set uh, yourself up for disappointment yeah. with your project itself. You, very much so. Um, I always use Beyonce for that because I, I have one time heard somebody say that they wanted to sound like Beyonce. And early on I was like, yeah, okay, thanks, that's a good reference. I have no idea. You're not going to sound like that. Say, well, that's not going to have your budget. Yeah, millions of dollars go into that. She's been at this for 30 years, and she's had all of the A&R that you can possibly add into an individual person. Um, she's got the best songwriters in the world writing those songs, arguably. Uh, <laughs> most effective songwriters in the world, maybe. Is it safe way to say that? So yeah, that's one of the dangerous expectations, is I want to sound like Beyonce, Coldplay, whatever it is yeah. that you're seeking to sound like. You can use them as an influence, but you shouldn't set up to want to sound like someone else because chances are you won't and you'll be disappointed. So a short list of those dangerous expectations that we encourage people to stay away from and, and to keep at bay throughout the process. Things like, I want this to make me famous. Uh, I want this to catch attention of music business stakeholders. I want this to get me more attention from my fan base or to earn me a fan base. Uh, I want this to sound like Beyonce or whatever. Um, the next conversation that really happens is the artist to the producer. Your opportunity to really kind of unpack what you're hoping to accomplish with this record. Uh, and keeping those healthy expectations in mind, um, you know, or part in this fashion, um, or have fun in the process by doing this certain experience or whatever. As an artist, it's really, it's a really good practice to come up with a playlist of reference tracks not for comparison or you know, for expectations of sounding like another artist, but for very specific elements that you might really uh, covet in another track. So for example, the drum sounds in this track or the acoustic piano sound in another track. Um, so what we like to do when working with clients is to have them come up with a playlist of reference tracks. But it's also really smart to come up with a list of what specific elements you like in each of those reference tracks to communicate to your producer what you're really looking for. And you're also going to find through that whole reference track process that that is a really useful way to sharpen your own production ear uh, by identifying a piano sound like Nora Jones, right? You can probably pick her out of a lineup just by your ears. 
Uh, that's going to inform your producer on the type of dude to hire for your session. Or if you have a friend that's going to be joining you on the record, that gives them something to study in order to kind of get into the vibe that you're hoping to accomplish, right? So just another way to, to manage the expectation of the people that are going to be involved in the album making process with you. Um, the other thing that, that I think is important for an artist to communicate to the producer as early as possible is what they are hoping for with that producer's involvement. Uh, do you want them to be a creative uh, partner or are you hoping that they take more of an engineer role and they're just there to, to, to speedily record your sessions? That one gets me in trouble sometimes. <laughs> and that one also can, can change on the fly. And as a producer, what is your first step when working with new clients? I always take people out to dinner or to coffee first. I always like to get them out of a studio setting so that we can build a relationship that's not purely based in that environment. Uh, but it gives us a chance to really hash some of these things out, talk about influences, talk about what they're currently listening to, uh, and then start to set these expectations very early on. It also gives me an opportunity to ask a lot of very pointed questions that help them to identify their expectations, both for my benefit and for theirs. And as an artist, or even as a producer, or studio musician, it almost doesn't matter what your role is in the record making process, but just be open to saying yes to new ideas, even if they're completely weird and you really didn't think that you thought that a, a fuzz guitar would sound right on your, on your album. Say yes to ideas, the worst that can happen is they're not used in the final product, but you never know what might end up being brilliant. Yeah, um, another one of the expectations that, that uh, I usually try to stop in the tracks is comparing yourself to other artists, uh, especially mainstream artists <laughs> that are, again, uh, working off of really high budgets with really experienced, really talented personnel uh, and a lot more time on their hands to finish a project. Uh, those are expectations that are very difficult to match, mostly on smaller budgets and smaller studios and smaller markets with less experienced players, etc. Uh, yeah, so don't compare yourself. That just needs to, to really learn the expectations again. Uh, clients are coming to you as a producer for your specific strengths and skills, not because they want you to try something that you've historically kind of sucked at or not enjoyed. So as a producer, I always am trying to be honest about what I can facilitate well, uh, and not only what I can do, but what I like to do and how I like to work, and identifying uh, the timeline that I work most comfortably on, the hours that I like to work, uh, how quickly I like to get projects done, uh, so that those expectations can be set really early on. For instance, I love, uh, best case scenario for me is to live in the studio for a solid week with a client. I love it. I love to just like wrap your head around nothing but that particular work of art for an extended amount of time. What's really hard is balancing multiple projects at once and then having to switch right back into your gear when you get to my place. Uh, because I, I had another session that morning and I'm still thinking about those guitar parts. And then all of a sudden we're switching into your parts and I'm just like, hang on a second. And that takes a little bit of time out of the day. And so if somebody's able to work on that timeline, then that really works out best for, for all of us and we're able to, to plan that well and budget that well and, uh, and hopefully just have a really smooth process. It's been really cool to watch you learn more about yourself mm -hmm. uh, as a producer but also as an artist over the last few years and working with different clients. So there's some stuff that you've learned that I think you might want to share with Yeah, um, one thing that, that I'm trying to keep in mind all the time as a, as a producer is to always keep art above business. So to always make sure that I am emotionally invested in what I'm working on rather than taking work that comes to me because it pays a little bit. That's part of the business side of it. Uh, and that's really the reason why we try to diversify what we do, so that we only are working on things that are important to us, with people that are important to us. Uh, because if you're going to be entering into a creative partnership with somebody, you have to have an emotional connection with them. I, I think that you do. Otherwise, you end up, um, you know, stamping out kind of the same type of projects every single time, and your artists are not really getting the best out of it. That's, that's a good one. Um, Early on, I thought that I had to be the smartest person in the room, and I had to have all the answers. And I've really gotten more comfortable not being that person lately. Uh, I think it's okay to not know everything. Uh, even if you know more than somebody else, you don't have to know everything. That's, 
that's an unnecessary responsibility to put on your shoulder as a producer. And I think that that's also an unnecessary responsibility for an artist to put on a producer. Because you as an artist coming into a session, um, really the best case scenario is that you have put a lot of thought into what you want to accomplish. Like setting those expectations like we talked about early on. Uh, and that way you can, you can really identify your role and the producer can really identify theirs as well and not have to shoulder too much or too little responsibility and everybody can, can walk away feeling like they put, put their best foot forward with that. I also have, have learned to lean on a team uh, for that exact reason because I might write really good guitar parts but I don't play them nearly as well as Tyler Martin does. <laughs> um, I may have really good uh, percussion ideas but Aaron Haas is a fantastic drummer. Um, Ryan Poole that we use for keys. Reese Murphy mixes pretty much every record that we put out because I'm a terrible mixer. Not because I'm bad at it, but because it doesn't fit my personality. I don't like it. I don't like being in a room by myself for 10 hours a day, uh, yeah. just messing with tiny little things. I think that's really important as a producer is recognizing who has the skills that are needed for this project. And Zach is done a really good job over the last few years building a team that helps him become stronger as a facilitator. And I think that it's also important to recognize that they're all, not always the perfect guy for that particular job. Uh, Aaron sometimes gets butt hurt because I don't use him on every record, um, but the records that I use him on, he is always incredibly confident, he is efficient, he is prepared, and he knocks it out of the park and we're able to do super quickly. On other projects, he may or may not be the best guy for that job. Um, also, it's really fun to call him out by name. I hope he sees this video and he's like, hey, you just watch out. It'd be great. Uh, the last thing that I'm really trying to learn, uh, even still, and I think that I will continue to learn, is how to take care of myself as a producer and really setting the expectation early on with artists about the scope of work that I'm willing to do for the budget that is available. Um, that's, that's a really big one. If it's a $20,000 budget, then crap, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend like a solid month in pre-production in my sweatpants. Right? And I'm going to come to you with like all these amazing ideas, hopefully they're amazing, and then we're going to be able to hash them out, just the two of us, for a long time before we ever even spend a dime on a, on a studio date. Right? Uh, that's not usually the case. And just as with anything else, your budget is going to determine a lot of your process. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we have a couple artists in the room, and I think that both of you are vets at this point. Uh, but we wanted to touch on budgeting really quickly and just how it ties back into managing ex expectations. Um, just remember to set realistic expectations. More times than not, you get what you pay for. Um, having you know friends play for free is not always going to be the best value for your budget because that could lead to costly studio time if they're not pro musicians. Um, but you guys probably know that already. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, touch, I love that you were saying that you're creating your own recording space and I think that's really cool. Uh, you're a little bit more experienced, but if there was anyone who was um, wanting to make their first project and couldn't really afford to hire a producer, or couldn't hire a studio, to, uh, couldn't afford studio time, um, I think that just doing your own projects at home with some basic recording software, even GarageBand works, basic microphone, basic interface, really will help you learn skills that you can carry on if, you, if your next project is in a studio and you're working with a producer and engineer. Just getting that basic knowledge, recording knowledge down is gonna help you better communicate with other people that you might be working with in the future. It happens all the time that somebody brings in demos that they've recorded at home and they have a certain kind of reverb or chorus effect on, this, on their vocal and they're really married to that idea. And usually we get to do even like a better version of that, you know, because a lot of times I've, I've got a, a few tricks up my sleeve that kind of help to dial those sounds in in a way that isn't overwhelming but still gets the point across. Uh, and so that's always a really cool thing to happen is when somebody's able to, to do some work to really put in the labor of like, this is what I want to accomplish uh, musically. Uh, and then I want to do this in a grander, larger scale, or a higher fidelity environment. Uh, and if you don't make it to the higher fidelity environment, then, then keep working on your skills at home, and then eventually you're going to end up in a cabin in the woods making Bond Air records um, that win Grammys by yourself, because you're amazing at what you do, because you put the freaking work in and you're smart. <laughs> yeah, when looking forward, you know, over your career trajectory, 
doing your own acoustic, very simple home recording is not a bad first project. No, not at all. It's, it's really cool to, to be able to look at a career trajectory with identifiable measures of success along the way. Uh, I was teaching music business classes for a couple of years at a, a media institute, and the first question that I would ask on the first day of every semester was, what is your measure of success? And what I mean by that is, what event do you need to have happen in your career in order for you to feel like you have made it? And a lot of people respond with something like, I want to win a Grammy, or I want to be on the cover of Time Magazine, or whatever. Um, and those are certainly, like we said earlier, they're not bad or wrong expectations to set of yourself, but probably unrealistic. Uh, and so instead of focusing on what you receive from your art, uh, you need to focus on what you can do. So, gosh, if you're first starting off and you want to feel like an artist, then freaking make something. You know, get an album out. Whether that's a home recording or you spend a crap ton of money on it, doesn't matter if it sucks or not, you did it. And you learned a tremendous amount through it. And the next time around, you're going to be able to apply those skills uh, to the next one and get better and better and better. And so you have all these, looking back, you've got all these little steps forward uh, where you're able to identify like, oh yeah, this is a season where I was really, really, really working hard on my lyricism. And it shows in this album, or I was really working hard on how to record acoustic sounding instruments because I was very interested in that particular thing at that time. Or maybe it's that, oh, I really was listening to a lot of pop music, and so I used a lot more digital sounds on this album. And so after a long time, you're able to see a lot of what you've already accomplished, uh, and you can look at those little markers as things that you learned that influenced the next phase of your creative development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... You kind of already said this, but just to drive the point home, it's important to release all expectations of what your album will do. It's more about what you will do in the process of creating the album. And I think a lot of you in here might know that, but I think that this is one of the big lessons that we've learned over the past few years is to release expectations of where your career is going to go. Yeah, and I think that uh, the, the healthy expectation is that each album is a reflection of your life and a snapshot of where you were at one period in time. But the cool thing about album making is that it gives you this magical look into the future of what your skills can be six months from now. Uh, you know, things such as, oh, I, my timing was really terrible, so we ended up having to do some editing to get my guitar to line up. Great, now you have something that you need to work on for your next record, so that as an artist you can say, I didn't do that. Uh, vocally, working on your vocal training, so that on your next record you're able to not have to rely on tuning, or time alignment, or uh, saturated reverb to hide all the mistakes that you're making. It really is a, a very objective look at your skill set. And that's what makes it a really cool art form, because it is incredibly subjective in terms of what somebody else thinks about it. But it is remarkably objective in terms of what you have an opportunity to take away from it. That's a pretty interesting art form. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're ex exploring with our blog is just, you know, how can I live more artfully? How can I make steps in my life so that I can feel, feel fulfilled? And I think that whenever you're setting out to make a recording project, the point should always be just simply to make art. Making art with others is the most rewarding experience, one of the most more rewarding experiences you could have. That's our presentation to be prepared. Uh, thank you guys for listening to us. So these are, these are ideas that we've really been tossing around too, so we're, we're thankful that you guys let us kind of talk through it because we're, we're trying to learn these things and, and kind of preparing a, a scripted statement on those things is, is weird when you're not really sure what you're walking into, what kind of audience is going to be in the room. Like I didn't know if there were going to be a, a few producers or mostly artists. We didn't know if they made a record before or if they were just looking to, to get some tips and tricks on like how to set up a home recording interface, which I'm all about. I know a crap ton about that stuff, and I will geek out with you for days. I'm sure y'all can have Dude, a long conversation. We, we can talk a lot. But, you know, 
I keep coming back to the blog, but I just feel like it comes full circle. Like we do, we're not experts on any one aspect of the music industry. We've just learned a lot along the way. And there goes your one here. <laughs> and uh, we really just want to share conversations with other artists and other people who are living artfully and and open that up and just kind of share what what we are thinking about and maybe that inspires something in you and maybe you have something to share with us that we can learn from. And that's that's basically where we are and yeah. it's been a long journey of kind of, you know, I've, we've we've definitely had unhealthy expectations that have not been met and I think that we've learned a lot from that. And I think another key to the reason that we built expectations in the first place was because we were out for our own self-interests. You know, we, we were we really wanted things to happen for us. Uh, and that, that's a, you know, that's fine. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily a, a bad thing, but it, it can lead to a lot of other really sketchy situations. Uh, it can lead to resentment from people in your peer group that are doing well. Uh, it can lead to a lot of hard partners and partners. Yeah. Trying to pursue mm. parallel careers, I guess. You know, we've really uh, learned a, a lot in our relationship about um, you know, helping each other and being supportive of each other. But I think that the the moment when we really started to we started to have living in an artful community as our top priority in life is when we started to feel like artists. And honestly, that's been within the last year. So really, not that long. Really, not that long. Um, but we're happier people now. I would say. Yeah, I guess we don't really need to do the whole like standing at the microphone thing anymore. You can just sit and talk. Hey, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's about all I do. This is really cool. Anyway, thank you so much, Trish, for having us today at Soundbridge Music. We've uh, This has been a really cool experience for us. Or I'm sure we'll get better at speaking in front of audiences, but this was great practice for us. Yeah, thank you for letting us come and do this. It was cool. Okay. Awesome.